Hey there, Rulers, DMO73 here, bringing you a feature match showing another card coming off the ban list in Hook with Dan Rowland on his Hook Grim versus Paul Reisman and his Tina Alice tag combo. Let's go ahead and jump right in. This lesson brought to you by Odyssey Games for pre orders and sealed product, CCG Prime for tons of singles and supplies, Cardo Doco for international rulers looking for products, and FoulLibrary.com for articles and wonderful deck lists, as well as our guest lecturer members, Vite Raman and Darren Noblock. Class is in session. So to get started here, just want to send you a reminder that we have Foul Fest coming up at the end of this month. All the information to get linked up to that is in the description below. Really hope to see you there. You are not going to want to miss this event. Uh, it's going to be three days of absolute uh, awesomeness and tons of prizing and all kinds of cool stuff. You're certainly not going to miss it, as well as all of the crazy side events we're going to be playing too. So hope to see you there. And uh, yeah, we have Paul Reisman on Tina and Alice, Fairy Queen Alice, with the new extension rule, playing against Dan Rowland, who is playing Kagia One plus Grim, uh, utilizing Captain Hook, who has now been unbanned, um, to try to use like Tell a Fairy Tale, which is the intention that they even mentioned on the post when they brought him back, is saying they wanted people to try to be able to use Tell a Fairy Tale for a powerful card, uh, and we have Hook, so we'll see exactly how this plays out. Um, Obviously, with Fairy Alice, you are able to use the Ascended Fairy Alice uh, because she has that ability that gives her the same name. So having a Judgment already costing five and then uh, or a cost of seven having it reduced down to five and then potentially just zero for a free flip based on how many fairies you have which is kind of insane is you can get very aggressive very fast with the fairy package uh, you can also play more of a mid-range strat but you can take advantage of your opponent really giving you an opening and push in pretty aggressively and then i imagine we'll see some cool things out of hook particularly with being able to use um, the ability to search for any fairy tale tell a fairy tale First turn, start the first turn. Stone of the Dragonoid is going to take 300 and get some dragon power counters. Not entirely sure why we're using um, that stone. We tried to start to go for a Misty Woods here, which would be pretty good. Helps us dig a little bit deeper. Do see a Kaguya there, so we'll get to grab that off the top. Keep in mind that Grim says you can play for fairy tales with will of any attribute, um, so that can be pretty helpful with this uh, thing. It also doesn't say fairy tale resonator. So grabbing Cage of Unknown Mother or Cage of Mother Goose is actually a really great grab here because Cage of Mother Goose has this like mastery before it was mastery kind of thing. Uh, Paul going in with a Will Coin Virtuous Crusade to get two fairies out. I do not like. Uh, I think this is a very strong play here, especially since Dan doesn't really have much action on the first turn and being able to capitalize and get 400 damage in as well as. Potentially start getting Tina ready to go pretty quickly. Getting eight damage in here nice uh, is nice, taking Dan down to uh, 29. And then just passing the turn there. Going into Dan's turn. Call Stone. To 4C, see another Forest of the Lost Misty Wood. Probably not getting that very much right now. Misty Wood's great because you can um, like pitch a Captain Hook to Grim's ability and then use Forest of the Lost to reanimate the Captain Hook, which would be kind of insane. Um, it's just a really cool kind of combination there using Kaguya 1 to set a card face down. Down comes the Cheshire Cat, getting to do a little bit of digging here. Oh, and then chooses to pass, which is interesting. I would have thought the Unknown Mother Goose would have come down potentially to pop the one of the tokens, at least. We do see a before recovery kilo of Fossil Girl in the city here to get rid of that Misty Woods. Paul says, no, thank you. I do not want to get double hooked in one turn. Thank you very much, which I think is totally valid. Uh, swings in for uh, another eight, taking Dan down to 21 and leaves up a couple will to just say pass turn. I think this is correct for Paul to leave up here. Um, you know that Grim is going to be looking into a hook. You know that going into this turn is a tell a fairy tale turn. So leaving up Will, especially since we know that there's Kilua in the deck, it's a good idea to probably hold some Will there, as well as being able to play into something like Girls Staring At or Muse Staring At. Um, although Paul's side of the board looks like red-white, so uh, Girls Staring At would be better. Just to make stuff not have any enter effects, you know, if the Telefairy Tale gets cast, you just respond with a um, 
girl staring at get to cycle make the hook feel bad as soon as she comes in it's just a 10 10 body taps dan out um and we're still just swinging in for you know eight in the air every turn we are going to see that unknown mother goose come down or cage of mother goose to remove one of those tokens out of the game it's just gone forever at this point and there is that tell a fairy tale kind of as we expected the question for Paul is, do we have something to answer the hook? Because losing both of our special magic stones right now would be pretty backbreaking. Um, we do see Captain Hook come down. We do have the Kilua uh, Fossil Girl in the city to stop the uh, enter effect. So that feels pretty good. Still a thousand thousand beater, though. It's something to certainly be considerate of, especially since Paul doesn't have a ton of board presence here. Oh, and an immediate follow-up with a second cage of Mother Goose to get that other token off the board. So that's a pretty big setback for Paul. Um, it does tap Dan out. So, you know, if we had a um, Dominatus here before recovery, that would probably be pretty close to being able to push lethal, especially because I think I already saw that there is a Fairy Twins in the hand for Paul. One of the big things to watch out for with this deck, if Dan even had a single will available or two will available, is based on the hand. Um, the Tinkerbell kind of board wipe is something that Dan kind of always has access to, provided he has will and cards in hand, because uh, you can pitch fairy tales to find, you know, the fairy tale that cheats itself in and find Tinkerbell. Um, and then, you know, kind of always have access to that board wipe over the course of a couple turns. Looking at that hand, though, it doesn't seem like Dan has much of that combo in hand here. Um, so we might be sitting in at something a little bit uh, less reactive and more proactive. Um, before recovery here, we're going to go ahead and see a flashing, or sorry, before combat here, we're going to go ahead and see a flashing smile to try to get that Captain Hook off the board. It'll also deal the damage to the Cheshire Cat. Dan says, yep, that's fine. Cheshire Cats get shuffled into the deck. And then we'll see if there's any kind of follow-up. You know, there, a Tell a Fairy Tale here would still feel pretty decent. Um, hopefully, Paul has something to answer a second one, but we'll see. What else gets cast here? A Forest of the Misty Woods to set up a Captain Hook wouldn't be too bad here either. We are going to see another Cheshire Cat come down. So this is what I'm talking about. We just saw that he has that fairy tale that lets him remove a light card to pay its cost. Uh, and he has another card in hand to be able to search out Tinkerbell. So Dan right now has the Tinkerbell board wipe available to him um, especially because he has two will open so this is something that against paul's deck would actually be pretty good um because you know paul goes super wide you just destroy it all pretty quickly um, unless paul has something to be able to give stuff eternal which would be good if he had access to another virtuous crusade in hand to be able to give all your fairies eternal it's just a question of does he have it we pay three for the um Magic Stone Earth to come into play recovered, which is kind of cool because it gets an extra will when he does judgment. Flame Sprite is in. We've got the 4-4 four, four token. We're going to try to swing in for two and swing in for four. That token takes Dan down to 15. Checking to see if he wants to maybe try to go in for contract right now. Without a Virtuous Crusade, it feels a little risky to try to just go in really aggressively. We are going to see a contract attempted here. So we have Tina, um, the Virtuous Stella. We're going to pay, going to go ahead and go in for judgment for a grand total of three. Uh, then we do get to try to recover the stone. We're going for a virtuous a meteor dive here to try to push in for lethal. Um, I mean, this is scary, but Dan thankfully has enough will to be able to play through here because we can discard uh, the Dark Alice uh, to go search for Tinkerbell because Tinkerbell is a fairy tale. We can then use that cage of Mother Goose in hand to pay the cost of... Um, the spirit to then destroy something and then leave 
And then we also can then pay one will to flash in the Tinkerbell. So a cage of Mother Goose being used for cost. Uh, Spirits of the Crimson Moon coming in here. It does have to destroy one of its own cage of Mother Gooses, but that already hit a token, so that's not going to do anything. Pay one. In comes the Tinkerbell, and everything gets wiped. Now, this is not too bad uh, because of the fact that uh, Paul does have access to Imperishable because of the extension rule for Fairy Alice. Does have a Flames right here to follow up. Um... And then just swing in for two. Uh, I don't think there's a reason to not at least try to get in for two damage, but Paul decides not to. Dan sitting, both of them sitting in top deck mode, it looks like, but the B for Dan is that, um, well, not even necessary. You can just hard slam a Captain Hook uh, because that's what you top deck. The beauty for Dan is that any card becomes any fairy tale that he wants in his hand. So it can become a Dark Alice. We can, you know, get some value that way and kind of replenish. Um, it's a lot of over time Dan gets to kind of claw back. Uh, it also can become, you know, uh, go search for a Kakia and cast the Kakia and cancel something from Paul. Um, you know, since Dan at this point is a little bit ahead. That's probably what we'll start to see coming down from those cards, especially if Paul doesn't have much of a follow up. And don't forget that Paul Dan does have two uh, face down cards, so that could be Prison in the Lunar Lake, um, most likely because we see all those. That might be a reason why we are playing the uh, um, Pain Stone, is that we have another stone that counts as being a Water Magic Stone. Um, Prison in the Lunar Lake would be gross. Um, Sign of the Future doesn't really help here very much now. Portal of Truth is another option potentially. Top decks the Forest of the Lost Misty Woods, hits the Kaguya off the top there. Um, this game is very quickly going in Dan's favor, um, especially since we can just go in Forest of the Misty Woods to get another um, another uh, hook right away. See a flash, flaming smile to come or flashing smile to come in and try to deal some damage. That Kaguya that we just found gets cast and cancels it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and use the last two will here to use Forest of the Lost Misty Woods to reanimate the Captain Hook in Graveyard. That's going to hit another two stones for Paul, putting Paul back to just one stone total, um, leaving him with just a stone that's not a 4C. Bur the, burying the 4C stone underneath the stone that hurts Paul. Um, and then passing the turn go into fairy twins and there's that prison in the Lunar Lake to stop the Fairy Twins. And that's just going to be the game here for Paul. There is absolutely no chance uh, of coming back at this point. Um, because uh, just one will at the, stealing down this board is not enough to save yourself. You can block the hook. Um, one of the hooks, uh, you'll go down to 20. But honestly, if I was in uh, Dan's position, I'd probably just go grab another Captain Hook, bounce the sprite, and then... Uh, go in for lethal. Do have a Tinkerbell there? Go in for 10. Going in for another 10. We get a block. We see this Kage to go in, take Paul down to 2000. And then we'll just kind of see what Paul finds here. Doesn't look great on an established board when we know that there's the ability to just grab any Kaguya we want. Um, anything that kind of takes a commitment here. We go into a Fairy Wayfinder, but it doesn't even draw a card because it's only other fairies you control. Paul goes to draw a card and goes, oh, right, yeah, doesn't do anything there. It uh, just serves as a blocker where there's enough damage, um, especially because Dan can just quick cast in this Tinkerbell at end of turn. And so Paul just scoops it up and we go into game two. Going into game two here, Paul choosing to take the coin, which is 
probably great for him having that excess will, especially in the face of not having to deal with the Captain Hunk so early. And even if a Captain Hunk does come down unanswered, we still have the coin to be able to play around with. Especially since Paul's deck is pretty much mono white. Outside of, you know, some splashed fairies and tech cards like Kilua. The question becomes now, Paul has seen the um, kind of Tinkerbell Spirits package kind of be used against. So the question is, do we see something to kind of um, help keep that from happening again? We do see just a coined Dominatus at the end of the turn. Um, Paul says, no, we're, we're, we're going to be going in, going down to 30, uh, 36, um, just trying to get kind of aggressive here. Um, Dan bringing in the falling into the cracks of time. So that end of turn Dominatus was actually great because you know, Dan could falling into the cracks, but it tap out. And then Paul would just go to his turn and make all the fairies during that turn too. So got to be really careful here. And Paul playing that really well. Seeing a another Cheshire Cat come down here potentially. Looks like does go in for a second Ch a Cheshire Cat here in game two. Does still have one will open for... Um, uh, falling of the cracks of time does have access to the Tinkerbell. The question is, do we have the spirit? Does not. So we see a play of a lightning cave. Also a pretty good option here, especially because it makes that that they can't gain swiftness. So this means that meteor dive is pretty turned off at that point, which is nice. We do see a virtuous crusade come down here. Paul says, well, you're tapped out. So I'm not as worried about the board wipe now. So we'll make another couple of tokens that don't care about having swiftness during your turn. We see that magic stone, the earth come down. Paul says that is fine. I will pay three and want access to the will, especially if I'm going to judgment uh, fairy Alice this turn. Making fairy twins. Getting into four tokens. We have five accessed now here. Paul is very much representing lethal at this point. Um, especially if there's a way that we can answer this lightning cave, which that will do it. That is a Kilua to pop the lightning cave. So now our stuff can gain swiftness and flying. At this point in time, we can go in for a contract for Tina because we certainly are at seal uh, our seal is reduced down to seal one we certainly have a stone now Paul gets really aggressive here with the flip here which is just missing out on damage um, but ultimately he could have swung with uh, two of the tokens first and then recovered and then gone in but does have the meteor dive in hand anyway so Dan's like oh yeah well with the meteor dive in hand there's no way to give swiftness so you're, you're there's no way for me to stop you so everything's just gonna die on the first swing especially since again Tina's gonna make a token give everybody two plus one plus one counters and then everything just swings in and murders um so Paul having the very aggressive start uh to a uh, and and the out honestly to the sideboarded card there for Dan uh worked out to be able to say you know what we're not even gonna give you time to play a hook we're just gonna try to finish the game out now um on my two stones which is one of the reasons why it's a little scary and like i think falling into the cracks of time would have been a better play um rather than the um rather than the lightning cave but i i see why we went for it there first turn fairy twins Seeing what Dan has here, hopefully he remembers not to try to tap out here. He saw how aggressive Paul can get with just two stones, especially getting that uh, magic stone. The earth was gross. Um, we do see Cheshire Cat come down. Trying to dig deep here. I saw that there was a lightning cave that's probably getting removed. Do you see a coin? For Forest of the Lost Misty Woods, I don't agree with this play at all. Um, being completely tacked out, knowing what Paul is capable of pushing through, and the fact that Paul is going to have two will without anything on field or in hand, like any kind of tricks to try to keep the flood of fairies coming in, I think that was a little bit of a mistake to go for Misty Woods. If we still had access to coin, I think maybe, um, but... You know, I, I probably would have played Misty Woods over Cheshire Cat in all honesty to try to dig so that I still have access to one will or I'd even just leave up um, the will to be able to search for a Tinkerbell or something like that.
Second Fairy Twins. Reading the Fairy Alice here. Missing the sequencing here for getting the free damage. Paul Dan reminds him, like, hey, swing with the fairies first. Dan kind of accepting his fate here. Uh, it takes the eight from the two fairy twins. We see the flip. We see the recover. We see the meteor dive. Now they're all going to be uh, bigger here. Paul messing up stones here like crazy. Um, currently, when Alice flips, he should have one the earth available. Meteor dive is free, though. Uh, and so then suddenly all of these fairies are huge. Uh, and they just swing in for lethal. Um, so that's going to be game. That's going to be the game. It's just a matter of it was a little sloppy in terms of sequencing and execution and remembering what you played and when you played it. But this is what I was talking about in terms of it felt very weird that Dan would choose to tap himself out here knowing the aggressive capability of fairies, particularly the fact that we're already two on board and we have access to the fairy Alice. Ultimately, though, said, yeah, I had the Tinkerbell, but um, no way to kind of get to the board wipe. So that is it. We'll put up deck profiles for both of these lists later this week. And until next time, this is DMO73 saying class dismissed.